Hello, this is Tim Halbach, the Warning Coordination Meteorologist for the National Weather Service Milwaukee Sullivan Office. With the updated spotter training session from 2021, we're going to go through the six parts of the training that we've offered up to our spotters for this year in an abbreviated version. So a little bit about our office. We're under the Department of Commerce and NOAA in the federal government, and our job is to provide warnings and forecast information for 20 counties in southern Wisconsin, which goes from essentially the Wisconsin Dells through Fond du Lac, Sheboygan counties on down to the Illinois border. So those are the 20 counties that we are responsible for with that uh, important forecast and warning information. We have uh, at least two members working at any time of the day. Uh, we, we have them split up between three different shifts. But when we have severe weather that is expected to occur, we have more people that come into the office, depending on how widespread and how severe those storms are expected to be. So our office is, up, is uh, located about halfway between Madison and Milwaukee in uh, eastern Jefferson County. So why are you watching spotter training videos? Uh, well, severe weather happens every year in Wisconsin, and we need reports of severe weather to be able to effectively warn the public of the inclement weather that's coming their way. People listen and wait for these reports to be able to make judgments about whether or not to go to their shelter. So we need reports from people, and we need to get them as fast as we can uh, when that severe weather is happening so that we can warn the public of what's coming their way. And that, unfortunately, that severe weather impacts people. We had a F5 tornado that happened back in July of 1996 through the community of uh, Oakfield and Fond du Lac County. And uh, luckily, we, uh, the, things could have been a lot worse with this tornado that came through. But a um, matter of minutes, it went from a, a storm that did not have a tornado on the ground to one that was uh, roaring as it as it came into the city there and people only had a few minutes to be able to get to their shelter so um, we need to get those reports as fast as we can so that people know that this uh, hazardous weather is coming their way all right so with storm spotter training there's four main parts to it there's the preparing you know, how do you know if today is a day where you need to know uh, whether or not you're going to have to go storm spotting deploying if you're a mobile spotter or just reporting from home, and then observing the weather and communicating it to the weather service. So in the six-part series, we're going to go through in depth each one of these different uh, these sections here. So who are storm spotters? Well, they're volunteers that give us the ground truth to what we're interpreting on radar. The radar doesn't say, okay, here's a tornado. We have to interpret what we're seeing on radar that those are conditions that are leading to that tornadic development. Same thing with hail or damaging winds. It's not telling us what's exactly happening at the ground, but we've correlated what we've seen in the past, uh, certain signatures that are either wind signatures or hail signatures, that when we see those, we assume that there is the severe weather that's happening, but we need these volunteer storm spotters to tell us exactly what's happening on the ground. Most people that get involved with storm spotting are weather enthusiasts that also have an interest in public safety. So how they help is, again, as I mentioned with radar, it's, it's a great tool for us to be able to monitor where storms are, but it doesn't tell us what's happening on the ground. The, the lowest cut that we get from our radar is a zero and a half degree angle off the horizon. So the farther away you get from a, from a radar, the higher that beam is off of the ground. So a lot of times we're not actually looking at uh, the tornado or the area where that tornado would be. It's more so the mid to upper portions of a thunderstorm where there could be rotation, but it's not telling us what's happening on the ground. So uh, we use that radar analysis to trigger the warning, but then the, the spotters are what's telling us that that weather is actually happening there on the ground. So what triggers a warning from the weather service? The baseline behind the ground, you know, the first thing we're always doing is, is establishing what the environment is like and what we're expecting that environment to do as time goes on. So is this a day where there could be tornadoes or is it a day where there could be uh, large hail, uh, thunderstorms, uh, those kinds of things? Is it a flood environment? We're doing all that assessment continually as uh, thunderstorms come through to kind of gauge how bad the situation might be. So 
the thing that pushes us over to issue a warning is whether or not we see something on radar or we get a report that that severe weather is happening. Our goal is that we identify a signature on radar first, and then after that uh, initial warning comes out, the report helps to validify that, that that severe weather is indeed there. So make sure you report to us. Even if a warning is out, don't assume that we know that uh, something is happening there because we're trying to get a jump and get some lead time to people that uh, that bad weather is coming their way. So just as an example for um, a storm that we issued a severe thunderstorm warning on last year that ended up producing quite a bit of hail, we, again, we, we have some a field like this called reflectivity where it's just telling us how much stuff is out there at that level. And our radar, we, we, do, we get more than just like the base lowest level scan. We can go up through the entire thunderstorm. And at different levels, we can make an assessment of whether or not there's the characteristics of large hail in this thunderstorm. And this was an example where we issued a warning based on those characteristics that we were seeing in the thunderstorm. And as we went up and up through the thunderstorm, it became, uh, it, it looked like this was going to be a pretty big uh, hail producer. But at the time, we didn't have a report of uh, what was happening there. So we issued the severe thunderstorm warning. And what ended up happening was a tennis ball sized hail. In a, we had two inch to um, higher hailstones from about Jackson heading east towards Cedarburg. And uh, as uh, the, the storm produced its, uh, produced this hail, it, it did take a while for us to get reports. It was the first re report that we got was uh, at, at 4.11 p.m. So you see the, the radar track here um, where the, by the storm is by Grafton and already to I-43. It was, took that long before we got any actual verification that that storm uh, was producing the large hail. So most of the reports came in well after the storm was over Lake Michigan. And unfortunately, at that point, we can't put that information into the warning. It's just, here's what ended up happening. So one of the things that really helps out from the spotters is that when people hear that there is an actual hazard out there, they tend to react to it a lot more, more quickly. So just imagine yourself, if you hear a warning that the source is radar indicated or something that uh, a signature that we're seeing on radar that is leading to that warning being issued, or would you react faster if you heard trained weather spotters reported golf ball size hail? Yet when you hear that it's actually happening, it's uh, much more of a reason to, um, to get moving if you need to get to your shelter or avoid the storm if you're in that near vicinity. So Relate that to back to tornadoes, the same thing with that. Uh, people are much more apt to take shelter or um, take more extreme measures, like say that it's the late evening and your kids are already sleeping. Parents might be a little hesitant to wake their kids up to take them down to the basement if they, uh, if it, if they think that maybe that tornado is not going to hit them. So if you are able to report that that tornado is there, uh, that's a lot more of a reason to, to make sure you go wake up those kids and get them into the basement. And that report that we get from you might be what sends somebody to that shelter. So the quicker that we can get these reports and, and put them into our warnings and send them off to the media to say, hey, we've got these rep storm reports in these locations, the more likely it is that people are going to hear those reports and act upon them. And that's where the kind of life-saving measures occur from uh, the, the reports that we get from storm spotters. So the rest of the videos that we're going to go through here is going to go through a, a day in the life of a storm spotter. So we're going to go through in the next video preparing. You know, how do you know that this is a day for severe weather? Deploying, whether you're a mobile spotter or you like to report from home. Observing, so you're seeing some severe weather and reporting it. And then communicate, how do you get that information to the weather service as fast as possible? So um, just note that these pictures here aren't from all the same event. They're just kind of piecemealed together to show a, a typical, typical way that a severe weather event goes.